Welcome to Loop TV. I'm Gene along with Doug for Friday, March 4th. Our two topics today are Amazon pushing for approval for its acquisition of MGM. And separately, Sony gets together with Honda to create a new partnership to build electric vehicles. And to the top, uh, the background here, of course, is that Amazon uh, has announced a long time ago that they're going to be acquiring what would like to acquire MGM for call it eight and a half billion dollars. As a point of reference, they paid about $13 billion for Whole Foods. That Whole Foods was their biggest acquisition to date. And uh, there's been, I guess, a lot of uh, focus on this uh, related to uh, what it means more broadly for tech and, and M&A. And so uh, we are hoping to get some sort of clarity around that and love you to weigh in. I think that will be the big takeaway uh, in terms of what happens here is if the FTC decides to take action and, and block this, I think that probably says a lot about how they might challenge other big tech related acquisitions. And in particular, I think the one we have to watch for is Microsoft and Activision. That's the biggest one to come. Um, if they don't take action and Amazon has kind of forced their hand a little bit, which I think is is a very worthwhile strategy that other so big wait, tech may use as well. Hand? As I understand it from the article that that the journal put out on it, basically the FTC has made a request for certain information about the acquisition. Amazon has gotten all that information together and given it to the FTC. And sort of by doing that, they've started a, a clock on the process where the FTC sort of has to respond or make a decision by mid-March. Okay. And if they don't, as I understand it, Amazon's sort of free to go ahead with the acquisition. Now, the FTC may still uh, challenge it in arrears. I think there's the ability to do that. But if the FTC takes no action, it sounds like the likelihood is that Amazon will be able to do this acquisition without challenge. Got it. And hard to predict how that ultimately is going to play out. So let's play it forward. Let's say it does get ultimately approved. Uh, what does it mean for broader tech? Should we see a quickening of M&A? I don't know about a quickening. I think that it probably in some ways takes off the proverbial handcuffs that big tech is probably wrestling with right now. I mean, other than Microsoft and, and Amazon with this deal, Google and Facebook have been fairly quiet with big M&A more recently. And I think part of that is because of the government scrutiny and sort of the uncertainty of if we go out and we try to make, let's say, a, a 10 or $20 billion acquisition, a significant acquisition, will the government challenge us and will we be able to get it done? And so I think if this happens, it feels like you'd have to think that the probabilities yeah. skew a little bit more favorably to those kinds of outcomes. Yeah, I would, I would guess, yeah, if you work at M&A and one of the bigger tech companies, you'd view that as uh, let's let's do some more work. And and I'm going to get the, the have the final word here is I did speak to a person who has worked at the highest levels of M&A uh, tech and largest companies and uh, their response. This is before the conflict started in the Ukraine. But the comment was uh, these these companies had come down a lot and this person's belief was that there would, we would see a quickening of M&A activity. And specifically is that this is the time, these are the windows that M&A, uh, uh, people who work in M&A uh, look forward to is uh, these kind of pull downs. And of course, you've been uh, very, you've been dead right on this, this concept, just because the stock is down a lot from its highs doesn't mean it's cheap. It could be down a lot from its highs and be grossly overvalued, or it could be a great deal. It, it uh, but uh, it, it does create an environment based on this conversation that uh, you, you see more work being done. And so my, my view is that I think you will see, if this does get through, I think you will see more M&A. And I'm actually going to give you the final word to change my mind. I'd uh, be curious, why is it that, you know, when we think about Mike, uh, all these uh, these mega tech companies, they actually, they just don't do big m and I mean, the Microsoft... Um, deal. Activision's a uh, really an, a, a total outlier. So what was that? 50, $60 billion, something like that. But then you have Whole Foods at 13 billion and, and Beats mm -hmm. at three and a half billion. And uh, I guess, uh, I don't know what YouTube. YouTube yeah, that billion. was a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, over a billion, one, one, six, five, if I remember. And Instagram was about a billion. I mean, why don't I think they? it's why a mix. It, it, well, what's, what's, I think is, is very interesting is 
it isn't always about the raw top line number with these companies. It's about the foresight of what's coming. So think about YouTube and Instagram in particular for Google and Facebook. I think they are probably the two best m a uh, deals ever done i mean mm-hmm. youtube at a billion six five i mean what do you think youtube's worth today 10 a hundred times that probably more than a hundred times more. that and instagram i mean several hundred times more valuable than a billion dollars and so i think they've they've done a great job the big tech companies of sort of saying you know we understand where the world is going we understand our customers really well and we think that you know these early them. companies yeah we might we might overpay in the moment but in the long run you know i think they've got a great view on on where the world is going and how to monetize that through MA. I, I was trying to get more at why why hasn't it i mean there, there's been some great growth companies and hmm. they don't why not bigger kind yeah, of? why why haven't they done more i guess i'm trying to think of a company a lot of the, the great quote great growth companies have rolled over which probably says they're the smartest person in the room but you know, when you think about companies like Unity, for example, or Snowflake, and I mean, um, you know, why not take a, a a bigger bite at at some of these? I think actually Facebook wanted to buy Unity. Facebook, at one yeah, point. they talked about Unity, but it was I, at like I a think much smaller valuation. It was. It was a few years ago. Um, I think though that the answer is actually a more practical one, which is really big M and A is hard to make work, and I think these companies know it and. Everybody, if you go back to 2000, we still have the specter of you know AOL and Time Warner, the biggest deal in history at the time, mm-hmm. which also ironically or unironically was the top of the market in that bubble. And so I think that when you're these big tech companies, yes, you have the ability to make massive deals, but the problem is you still have to make the deals make economic yeah. sense over the long term. And I think they find it easier to make deals that have that sort of economically sensible component when they buy something that's a little bit smaller in scale and maybe rapidly growing, but in a, in an industry or a vertical that they're interested in and really have a, an understanding of, and maybe even a different view than the market. Excellent. We'll move on to Sony and Honda. So they announced this partnership. I believe that they're calling it new company and it is expected to uh, bring a new vehicle, electric vehicle, the first of the partnership to market in 2025. Not sure what this means for Honda and GM's uh, partnership to create electric vehicles. And I also have a, a, a sense, or this does mean that, that Sony's um, aspirations about building their own electric car by themselves, they've now uh, have, uh, have have gone away from those. Those are no longer, that's no longer the plan for, for Sony. And I want to, uh, just from the highest level is why does it make sense for these two companies to come together? I think it's because we have seen, and Tesla's probably originated this, but the idea that a car is really a consumer device, a consumer electronic at this point. And so to have that kind of Sony CE experience from making things like the PlayStation. They provide components to smartphone manufacturers. I think, you know, them bringing in, what does it take to kind of make a great consumer uh, electronic really oriented around a customer experience versus a vehicle that's oriented around transportation? I think that that's kind of where the world is going. And I think, by the way, that's it's probably also a big reason why Apple is exploring the auto space because they see the same thing that, you know, a car, and in my view, whether it's gas powered or electric power, I think it's a device. It's a, you know, it's, it's a consumer technology device at this point. Um, and it's not really just about transportation anymore. And does the, the concept we've had, I think a debate, maybe a, a different view in terms of uh, how to think about Tesla. I think about it as a tech company uh, and uh, I think you've thought of traditional auto as still making cars. And um, if, as you think about it becoming more of a of a consumer electronics company, uh, does that change how you think ultimately of like Tesla as a tech company or other automotive companies' ability to become a tech company? Well, I mean, I would say the moniker tech company has lost a meaning in some sense. And we've been saying this ever since we started Loop five years ago, that every company is becoming a tech company. And so um, it's not that Tesla is not a tech company. It's that other auto companies are becoming tech companies too. I mean, I think that's really more the direction. Uh, and it's nothing against Tesla. 
I think it's just that this is the way the, the industry is going by Tesla's prompting. Mm -hmm. And you look at what Ford did earlier this week, separating their ICE and the EV division. I think that that in their own way, whether you think it matters or not, to me is them saying, you know, hey, we are a tech company and we have this tech division, which uh, coincidentally is basically being run by an ex-Apple and Tesla guy in, uh, in Doug Fields, right? Mm -hmm. And does the uh, view of more digital components, uh, more of a gadget, does it change what you think that the long-term margin profile of these EVs will be? Let's say that the industry right now is uh, overall automotive, uh, excluding Tesla as like a 7% kind of a gross margin business. Uh, where do you think that that goes as kind of the DNA of these vehicles changes? I think it can go up a little bit, but if you're talking about the pure vehicle, separate out the idea that these companies will ultimately sell software and services. I think that's a different business. But if you're talking about pure vehicle margins, I think that maybe they go up nominally, but I don't think they're going to double. And the reason for that is simple. The reason that the margins in the industry are low to begin with is because it's a very competitive industry. And anytime you have an industry with dozens of competitors, everybody is focused on taking a little bit more margin from themselves for themselves or taking a little bit more share from themselves. And it makes it harder to drive bigger margins. The way that people have historically driven good margins in the auto business Look at a company like Ferrari, you make it a luxury vehicle, you make it an aspirational uh, vehicle. And so outside of things like that, I do think that the tr uh, traditional sort of OEM space, whether it's electric, whether it's gas, I, I do think that those margins are probably going to stay in that, you know, historical range, maybe a little bit higher, but not drastically. Would your view be that Tesla's, let's call it their 30% gross margin starts to bend downward over time as competition comes out? I think that would be the smart bet. Yes. And again, it's nothing against Tesla. It is, it's, it's purely an acceptance that that's what happens when competition comes. And Tesla basically has had no competition for the last several years. And now we're starting to see some of these cars come to market. And like we've been saying, ultimately the volumes and the sales to customers will tell you about the demand for Tesla vehicles relative to these other OEMs. But I do think that in time, as more electric options are available and Tesla is really not the only game in town, I think we could see some more margin pressure there. I'm going to take the last word. Uh, and I think that it's going to be 25% or better. So I'm on the other side of, of that. I think that I'm not saying all of auto is going to come up to that 25% uh, number, but specifically to Tesla. I think that it, it holds in there. Uh, well, time, time will tell. That's what makes a market. We have different opinions on this. Uh, so we have a market. Another market, I buried the lead uh, on this story on purpose because I wanted to leave on, on this note, wrap up on this note, which is uh, as part of that announcement between Sony and Honda, Honda said that they expect to be making gas powered vehicles into 2040. That's 18 years from now. Just yesterday, Doug, you were commenting that it's going to take a lot longer than you think. I think that probably would be the number you'd have had when you thought about a lot longer than you think. 2040, we're not there. It is not a official points on the board, but in the futures market of making predictions, uh, you're having a great day today. Good work on that. On behalf of Doug, Gene, and Luke TV, bye for now.